we're talking about the nature of the Lord's Song. Um, uh, spoke last of all about the location. Um, now, the new topic that I want to look at is the uh, times for sacred song. We already touched on it. It's morning and evening. Uh, so uh, it's the daily burnt offering in the morning, in the evening, at the temple. Now, why the morning? Because it's the beginning of a new day. And the new day begins with God. Um, and the basic idea is that uh, uh, God meets with his people to sanctify them and to bless them uh, for the new day. So that they are his holy people bringing his blessing into their daily lives. And then in the evening you have the, the day closes. Uh, late afternoon, but it concludes uh, uh, towards the end of the day where you have the sunset. So the day begins and ends with sacrifice and praise. Um, the beginning of the day, uh, so that the whole day is filled with God's praise. There's lots of reference to this in the psalm. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all day long. And likewise, and this is more significant, uh, it ends in the day so that you carry God and his blessing into the night, night, the time of darkness uh, and of spiritual attack. So for protection and blessing day and night, uh, God going with his people. Then besides the, the daily uh, time of song, uh, there are the special occasions, the Sabbaths, once every week, and then uh, uh, the new moon days, the beginning of every month. The Jews have, a, uh, the Old Testament has a lunar calendar. Uh, the new moon day is significant, the beginning of every month. Uh, and then most significantly, the three great pilgrim festivals. They're called pilgrim festivals because they are occasions on which the uh, uh, people of Israel, at least every uh, uh, the representatives of every family, uh, that's at the very least, is the adult males. So every male over the age of 30, uh, and, and uh, either the head of every family or the representative head of every family, is obliged to meet with God at the temple in Jerusalem. That's for people who live within the land of Israel. If you live outside the land, okay, you're, you, you're, you're freed from that obligation. Um, you ask, what about women and children? That's not mandatory. It doesn't mean that they can't come and don't come, but they don't have to come. Obviously, it's going to be difficult to make the distance on foot if you're pregnant or you've got a baby to look after or half a dozen kids to look after. Uh, but older women... Uh, and I don't know about younger single women, um, they have a different status in the ancient world, but older women who are freed from the burden of uh, children uh, would go too. We know from the example of Jesus' family that his whole family used to go up, not just Joseph, but Mary as well, and Jesus too. This was rather exceptional. Uh, remember Jesus as the 12-year-old boy went up to Jerusalem uh, for uh, the Feast of Passover and other feasts, already as a child. So those great occasions, those very significant occasions, and it's on these occasions that the uh, ordinary people would, as it were, connect with the services that were offered <coughs> at the Temple in Jerusalem. It was on these occasions that the ordinary people would bring their offerings from the first fruits and the firstborn animals, and they would eat and drink in God's presence. Everybody looked forward to that because these were the times, these were their holidays, their feast days in the true sense of the word. Um, they would live like kings for, and queens for the seven days of Pentecost, the, no, the seven days of Passover, the one day of Pentecost, um, 
uh, that's at a very important time in the agriculture. You can't leave the farm too long. Um, uh, uh, the Passover is the beginning of the agricultural year, and then uh, Tabernacles is the end of the agricultural year. Um, and there you have an, a, a, the, that's the great celebration, the, the eight days of rejoicing. Um, at the end of the harvest, the end of the grape harvest, so you had plenty of wine to drink um, and you had lots of first fruits. Um, and you could celebrate and rejoice with your family in God's presence at the temple in Jerusalem. So the times of sacred song are the times of rejoicing, um, the times for joy, significant times. Now, David also established the instruments for sacred song. Um, they are called the instruments of God's song or just the instruments of song. So they're not called musical instruments, but the instruments of song, they were meant to accompany singing. Notice the connection between singing and music. You had the silver trumpets, which go back to Moses. Um, God had commanded Moses um, to make these long silver trumpets, uh, yay long, uh, and they uh, were royal uh, instruments to announce the presence of the king. Now we have some idea of what they look like because, um, uh, and you can go to, to Rome to see him of all places, on the Ark of Titus. I'm mean, not the Ark of Titus, the, the triumphal, uh, 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 what are they called? Yeah, triumphal, what? Arch, arch, not Ark. The Arch of Titus. Um, you may remember, if you know some ancient history, is that Titus was the Roman general who sacked Jerusalem and carried all the booty from the temple and the city back to Rome. And to commemorate his type, his great triumph, uh, uh, there are inscriptions there on this uh, uh, arch. And prominent among them are for us Christians and for Jews are two things. One is a copy of the menorah the seven-armed uh, 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 lampstand. So we know what that looks like because there is an inscription there. Uh, but as well as that, in connection with the menorah, you have two crossed silver trumpets. Now, probably the Romans had no idea of their significance, but they look good, and so they uh, put them there on their Titus's triumphal arch. Now, but remember, this goes back. This is the only instrument that goes back to Moses and the time in the desert. Um, they announce the presence of God, the King. Now, uh, uh, um, we have a Bach specialist here with Dan. Have you ever noticed where the trumpets are used in Bach's cantatas and Bach's music? High feasts. What and and it's not just high feasts, but what? more narrowly, it's high feasts. Do you mean the liturgy? No, in 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 his uh, uh, in his yes in his uh, well, his various pieces of liturgical music. The Christmas oratorio. The other occur in Christmas oratorio, particularly Easter oratorio. Easter oratorio. And the cantata. That's right. So it's the festivals, and what do they proclaim? The presence of Christ the King. Christ the King. Um, take note of that next time you listen to uh, these great works of Bach. So this, the, the memory of this, the knowledge of this, is, was still there in Bach's time. In the Mass, the Gloria. Gloria. The and the Sanct. Yeah, that, there you have it. Right? Okay, you're doing a mental Glory. check. Glory. Uh, the glory of the king, announcing the presence, the glory of the king. Angels. Angels too. Yes, that goes together. Um, right? That's part of our heritage. Um, the presence of Christ the king. Okay, then besides, so you have the uh, instruments of uh, 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 these trumpets, and then there were the instruments of David. These were the instruments that David arranged to be made. 
and there were three different kinds. There were the symbols um, for the leader of the choir. Now, I think quite functionally, what's the function of symbols? Attention. Calling attention. Uh, but also they announced then the end of each verse. So at the beginning, you know, when the choir is ready to go, good to go, uh, people are chattering, there's lots of movement around, yes. there's the clashing of symbols, people shut up. We well, hope they shut up. That's what you need. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Bring one tomorrow. <laughs> I'll appoint you as chief symbolist, and that'll shut you up. <laughs> Uh, uh, Psalm 150 talks about two kinds of symbols. There are uh, loud symbols and loud, no, symbols and loud clashing symbols. Remember that? Yes. The clashing symbols are those attention-getting ones. And then there's smaller ones um, that we're not quite sure about, but they may have been um, uh, to, to, to establish rhythm beat. I don't know, but that's just a theory. The important one is the clashing symbols. So at the beginning and end of the song, uh, and they announced the end of every verse, and the end of every verse, the, the congregation would prostrate themselves uh, towards the altar. So it's a signal not only for the end of the verse, but it's a signal for prostration. Uh, very practical. You, you don't make, at least I've never heard anybody sound a tune on cymbals, uh, but they make a good noise. Remember that Paul speaks about that too. Um, but the most significant instruments were the harp and the lyre. Now the lyre is the important, ones, the important one, because the basic melody of the psalm, uh, of the song was performed on a lyre. The lyre looked, and I'm not very good at drawing things, but looked a little bit like this. Uh, if you imagine, uh, you can sit down and it sits there on your lap and you play it from back here. Uh, um, uh, you use the very fingers. Uh, it has to be tuned. Uh, I think I told you that, that archaeologists have discovered a uh, tracked on tuning, a uh, hurrian tracked on tuning a lyre, which has helped musicians enormously. Because we, before that, we had no idea. We had an idea of what these looked like, and you could build th them, but you know, you need, need to know how to tune them uh, if you're going to uh, 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 try and reconstruct the melodies. But the same, tr uh, the same uh, document that, uh, uh, tells people how to tune the lyre, also gives a sample song with notation. And there's some really cool uh, examples. There's a number of uh, uh, recordings of that hypothetical lyre. Now, the, the lyre basically perform, does the music. The harmony is done by the so-called harp. Um, forget about you know, the modern harp. Uh, it's a, a, very much like a lyre, but it's a bigger instrument. And the basic difference is the sounding box down here. Uh, now, and you have, this usually has seven strings. This has ten strings. Um, as far, you know, uh, scholars hypothesize that uh, uh, seven of those ten strings were for playing melody or for playing notes, and the other strings were basically uh, to resonate. Now, uh, uh, so they filled in uh, that vibrating sound. Um, this gives the bass, if you like. And the, the harmony, this gives the melody. Okay, they are the instruments of song. They are the instruments of David. And they're quite famous because they were handed down um, uh, the generations. 
So they were made by David. They had special significance. They were especially holy because they were uh, uh, handed down uh, from the very beginning. Any questions or, on that? Most of the pictures that you get in books, at least the old books, uh, are misleading, particularly on harps. By the way, in, in the book of Revelation, you quite often uh, have uh, lyre uh, is translated as harp. And so if the angel playing harps, forget about angels playing harps. What do they play? They play lyres. Sither uh, ra in Greek. Okay, any questions, observations on that? Now, as well as that, we know that on festivals, um, uh, at festivals, uh, the musicians also played flutes, but the flutes were not played in the holy place. They were played as part of the procession. Uh, they were a processional instrument. And there's some indication of some other instruments that we're not sure about. Um, there were shakers uh, and things like that as well. But they were basically for processions. Now we come probably to one of the most important things, and particularly for us as Christians of the New Testament, that's the, the musicians, the performers of sacred song. Um, now, um, here in America, you've retained the tradition of calling uh, the chief, chief musician in a church or in uh, the seminary cantors. That is part of the tradition from Leviticus, and uh, no, from uh, Chronicles, uh, and uh, uh, is very, very traditional. So Bach, when he referred to himself, he uh, understood that he had a special calling within the church. He was a cantor. Uh, cantor means singer, but singer, cantor doesn't just mean singer, but it means a person who is the lead singer, who leads the song and performs the, and leads the uh, a musical accompaniment to the song. Now, who, who performed the song? First of all, obviously, there were the two priests uh, with the trumpets. Then on special occasions, you had more. You remember there were seven priests on the, that were used in the great procession that brought the ark into Jerusalem. We know, thirdly, that 120 trumpeters played uh, for the dedication of the temple in Jerusalem. Um, it, they made some noise. Uh, 120, you can imagine. The whole of Jerusalem would have heard the uh, um, echo of that. Now, the most important person uh, is David. You can imagine, even David is the singer. David is the uh, musician. And he appoints uh, uh, the other music, the Levitical musicians, and he gives them his psalm, his song, and he gives them his musical instruments so that they can perform on his behalf. One of the things that you need to do when you study scripture and look at it closely is to look for the unexpected and particularly stuff that doesn't really make sense because that very often is the important thing. Let me read uh, this account of what uh, happened at the dedication of the temple in Jerusalem. Remember, it's time of Solomon. Uh, it's the high point of the dedication. The, right, the author of Chronicles says this, the Levites also stood at their posts, their posts we saw, now that place on top of the steps, with the instruments for song to or about the Lord that David had made for giving thanks to or about the Lord for his steadfast love endures forever. Notice the thanksgiving refrain uh, that comes up again and again. So they... Uh, give thanks to the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Whenever David offered praises by their ministry, by their hand. 
What makes no obvious sense here? What's the surprise? Look at it again. Yeah. Where's David? He's carked it. He's six feet under. And yet, through the choir, David continues to offer praises to the Lord. Now, just, just, just think that through. He's dead. He's gone. Uh, his son Solomon reigns in his stead. It's not Solomon who offers the praises, but David does it. Um, uh, now, uh, uh, even though he's dead and done for, now, um, uh, this is important because uh, David is not just David, but in his office he is the founder of the monarchy. He, is, he represents the monarchy, and he is the messianic king. And prophetically, he points to Jesus. He is uh, uh, the, the king who performs praises. Now, this is going to be important for the New Testament uh, for one reason, and that's this. In the New Testament, Jesus is the praise leader, the praise singer. And we, the congregation, are the uh, musical group. We are the choir. And the choir consists of the whole congregation, not just the local congregation. The choir is enormous because it's a choir that includes all Christians around the world. It's a choir that includes all Christians from the past to the present to the future. It's a choir and a group of musicians that consists of the angels and archangels. Uh, it's a big, big choir. And at the head of this choir is the leader who is Jesus, the King. As Messiah, he is the choir leader, choir director. Uh, then uh, quite obviously, you have the Levitical musicians on behalf of David, and they have a dual status. On the one hand, they're connected with the monarchy and kingship through David. On the other hand, because they're Levites, they're connected with the priesthood. So they represent David and they uh, help the congregation perform their divine service. Uh, they help the congregation do what uh, their part in the service. On the other hand, they liturgize, not only on behalf of the congregation, but they liturgize together with the priests. So they have this dual role. They stand in two camps and their position in the sanctuary represents that. They liturgize uh, in the divine service. Uh, uh, this is going to be important when we come to the New Testament, when Hebrews talks about the angels as ministering or liturgizing spirits. They assist us in the liturgy. Uh, they are liturgizing spirits. Um, next, uh, who are the performers of sacred song? They are, it's the whole congregation. Not, and this is the odd thing about it, it's not only the congregation that's present there at that time in Jerusalem, but the whole of Israel is uh, caught up or drawn into that song. And Israel does it on behalf of the nations and on behalf of the whole world. I don't know, have you ever noticed how often the Psalms call on the whole of Israel, the whole of the congregation, to join in the singing of praises? And more oddly than that, it calls on all the nations of the earth to join in praising God. Um, so who praises God in uh, the performance of sacred song? First, most importantly, it's David. David practically can't do it by himself. He obviously doesn't have the time, even though he's a good musician, uh, doesn't have the time uh, to do so, and maybe he doesn't have the skills to do so. So he appoints the choir 
to represent him. So the choir represents him, but the choir also uh, uh, represents the congregation. And the congregation represents the all the nations. And go, it goes further than that. All uh, The uh, choir represents the whole of creation that's been created by God for his glory, but has no breath, and therefore because it has no breath, it cannot praise God. And so it depends on human beings who have breath to praise God. Have any of you noticed the odd ending to Psalm 150, the great hallelujah psalm? No, you, you praise God in heaven and on earth uh, with every instrument in every possible way. It's a hallelujah, hallelujah, praise the Lord. And it ends with, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. The notion there is that God has given us breath so that we can praise him. Um, other creatures, uh, particularly inanimate creatures, don't have breath, don't have language. They can't uh, 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 praise God. But coming out of this, um, and there's, there's, there's other origins of this, there's the notion that the whole of creation makes music. That if you had ears to hear, you would hear the harmony of the spheres. The order in the world is a kind of musical order, but it's, you can't hear it. It's inaudible to human ears. What the instruments of music do is articulate the praise of inanimate creation. And it's drawn into the praise of animate creatures, human beings, so that uh, breathing creation and non-breathing creation, animate creatures and inanimate creatures together praise the Lord. Dan, you're smiling. Why are you smiling? It's just it's wonderful. I love it. It's just very helpful. Good. I was hoping. Any ammunition? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> But don't use it constructively, not destructively. <laughs> Always. Always, yes. I trust you, Dad. Could not be. Well, I hope not. Um, uh, by the way, that's, uh, the old Lutherans wrote a great deal about uh, uh, the importance of music and praise, and, and they develop a lot of these themes that I've touched on. Unfortunately, none of it's translated in English. Now, that's, you know, if you have someone here who wants to do some translation, um, there's some good PhDs there um, uh, for somebody who wants to do it. The ritual function of sacred song. Uh, how does it fit into the liturgy, the order of service, and what does it do within the liturgy? Um, the first part of this, oh, just before I go on, any, any questions, observations that you want to make before we move on? I, re I remember uh, a few years ago and uh, that someone had taken a recording of crickets yes. and had slowed it down. Did anybody, anybody hear that? It slowed it way, way, way down and it was... Uh, almost like an orchestra. It was beautiful. And it, this yeah. reminds me of that. Well, and uh, people have done the same thing with whales. And dolphins. And bird song. Uh, there's a very famous uh, composer who's basically been inspired by bird song, and that's Messian. Uh, uh, and he recorded bird song and uh, played around with it because we don't have the same auditory uh, uh, facilities as birds. So he tried to listen to bird song, not with human ears, but with uh, bird's ears. Um, he was a very strange, an odd man because, uh, no, in a good way, an amazing guy, uh, uh, because he had, uh, 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 he had synesthesia, which means that the mixing of 
uh, senses. So he could hear colour. Uh, he could uh, see, smell, uh, but particularly hearing colour uh, and seeing, smell. And so all, all the senses were intertwined in a strange way. Now, our brain is constructed normally is to separate the various senses. So hearing is separated from seeing, which is separating from smell, taste and touch. And he'd say, he'd, he would say, say, somebody came and touched him, he'd say, that's that key or that note. Right? He would hear the touch, but he was particularly, uh, uh, he had very hearing dominant and all his other senses basically fed into his hearing and into his music. At least that's what I'm told. Uh, I don't know whether he was faking it. <laughs> It would be a bit disturbing, actually. Okay, uh, you know, Bonnie's wearing that colour there. Okay, and I hear this uh, key, this music all the time when I see that that colour. No, oh, that's a bit disturbing, I must say. Not because you're disturbing, but it, it's it's a uh, it's not your new, usual thing. Anything else? Okay, now, the ritual function of sacred song. How's time going? Um, well, the most important thing is that it's the Lord's song. It has to do with the Lord and the name of the Lord. It's associated with the divine service. It's the song of the Lord's house for the service of the Lord's house. Um, the the uh, Levitical choir perform cho uh, uh, choral music as part of the divine service. So there was the service of sacrifice, but there is the service of song. Now, if I can give an analogy for our modern Lutheran usage, we have, we have the service of the word, we have the service of the sacrament. So in the temple, you have the service of sacrifice and you have the service of song. Uh, the two complement each other. Uh, they're all together part of the one single service. The service of song, the service of sacrifice. And remember that there was no preaching at the temple. Um, the only spoken parts of the temple, the only spoken part of the temple liturgy was the ironic benediction. Uh, the only other audible, you know, spoken you could say is the sung part is the choir. So the choir does the preaching. The choir does the preaching. The only uh, thing, the speaking that the priests do is when they perform the ironic benediction. Um, by the time of Jesus, there was one other uh, spoken part of the service, and that was the prayer of the high priest uh, on the Day of Atonement. Uh, and you can find the wording of that in the Jewish Mishnah. So it's different to our service. There's no exact correspondence. Okay. Um, sacred song was performed as liturgical ministry on behalf of David. They liturgize. It's part of the liturgy. Now, let me uh, 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 make sure you understand what's meant by liturgy. Uh, People usually get it wrong, at least in Australia. People ask me, what liturgy are we having today as a pastor? What do they mean by liturgy? Which order of service? And not just which order of service, but which... What? Which service? And it's, it's which musical setting of the order of service. So which order of service? I say communion service. They say, no, but which liturgy? which means which uh, uh, musical uh, setting of the order do we have? Now, liturgy is not order of service, and it's not a particular musical order of service. Liturgy is a more general sense, has a general sense, and it's work that is done uh, on, on behalf of other people. It's work, divine work, service that's done on behalf of 
the people. Now, um, the priests perform the divine service on behalf of the rest of the nation. They liturgize on behalf of the nation. And the uh, Levites assist the priests in their performance of the divine service. The singers liturgize on behalf of who? Congregation. Firstly, more, more immediately than that, on behalf of David. They liturgize on behalf of David, who liturgizes on behalf of Israel, and they lit it liturgize on behalf of all the nations. So it is work done on behalf of uh, 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 the nation. It's vicarious. The, the notion here is something that's done vicariously um, for somebody else. So they liturgize. Remember that in Hebrews, Jesus is the liturgist in the heavenly sanctuary. Now, the most significant thing, practically, is the fact that sacred song is synchronized with the daily burnt offering. Two things occur together. Now, the way things happen is always significant. So as soon as the burnt offering begins, the song begins, as soon as the burnt offering ends, the uh, song ends. So they occur together, they are synchronized. And if they're synchronized, it means that they, uh, you make sense, the one makes sense of the other, they belong together. If you want to understand what's happening in the uh, burnt offering, you listen to the song. If you want to understand the function of the song, you look at the fact that it is connected with the uh, uh, sacrifice. And from that comes the term that you're familiar with. It's the notion we, off we present to God an offering of praise. Uh, the notion of, or a sacrifice of praise. We'll come to that in the New Testament. Um, the classical place that describes this is in, yeah, I, okay, there's two, two pa three passages that, I think are three passages, yes, that I want to look at. Um, when David brought the ark to Jerusalem, he established one third, one, one guild of the Levitical choir to perform music in the tent before the ark in Jerusalem. The other two guilds were at Gibeon, where the altar was, and there was the daily burnt offering every morning, every evening. And it's in that connection that we read with them, that's the priests at Gibeon, were Heman and Jeduthun, and the rest of those chosen and expressly named to give thanks to the Lord for his st steadfast love or his mercy endures forever. So notice here already you have the synchronization between sacrifice and song. Um, we'll go to 1 Chronicles 23, 30 to 31. Uh, this describes David's arrangement uh, of the uh, 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 Levites and priests for the divine service. And they, that's the Levite singers, were to stand every morning thanking and praising the Lord, and likewise in the evening. And whenever burnt offerings were offered to the Lord on Sabbaths, new moons, and feast days, according to the number required of them, regularly before the Lord. Right? The two belong together. Praise and sacrifice. Sacrifice and praise. Uh, you see that most clearly in the account of Hezekiah's restoration of the divine service uh, 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 as a second David, around about 700 uh, BC. That's roughly speaking 300 years after David. This is what we read about what Hezekiah arranged. The Levites stood with the instruments of, not of Hezekiah, but of David, and the priests with their trumpets. Then Hezekiah commanded that the burnt offering be offered on the altar. Now this is important because his son, his, no, his father had stopped offering the burnt offering. 
So this is the re, uh, in, re inauguration of the burnt offering at the temple. When the offering began, the song of the Lord began also. And the trump and trumpets accompanied by the instruments of David, king of Israel. The whole assembly performed prostration and the singers sang and the trumpeters sounded. All this continued until the burnt offering was finished. And they, that's the singers, sang praises with rejoicing and they bowed down and performed prostration. Note the association here of the Lord's song with the presentation of the burnt offering and the blowing of the trumpets over the altar and over the offerings. So those three things together, uh, the offerings, the blowing of the trumpets, the performance of the song. And notice too the association of the Lord's song with prostration by the congregation during the burnt offering and by the singers at the end of the song. Now most uh, modern English translations say uh, talk about worship rather than prostration. Now there's a, uh, uh, there's a particular Protestant bias that goes all the way back to the Reformation and an anti-Catholic, uh, anti-sacramental bias going back to the English Reformation. Now, hishtachava, proskenea in Greek, is doing this. So, bowing down, uh, kneeling, and then putting your head on the altar. Uh, on the, not the altar, the floor. Um, do you know which religion, for which religion that's the central ritual? Islam. Islam means doing that as a slave to Allah. Uh, prostration. Now, um, uh, uh, the English reformers, and to some extent the uh, uh, reform tradition of Calvin, and particularly Swingley, um, uh, uh, didn't like that because it was physical. You don't um, worship God, you don't interact with God physically. What's important is your mind, your heart, your spirit. And so it's translated as worship. And since that time, we've been stuck with that woolly, waffly word, worship. I wish I could ban it from use, at least in my church, if not in all churches. Um, you know, worship, what, what does that communicate? You know its origin, it means worth-ship, ascribing worth to something. But that doesn't touch on what goes on here. And the focus is on what we do. It's not that God has worth and that we honour him, but that we ascribe worth to him. Um, it's what we do uh, that counts. Uh, and a lot of the problems that we have uh, and a lot of the worship wars that we have are uh, associated not just with word but with a whole theology that uh, lies around this word. So um, it's, let me tell you what happened. At the end of each verse, uh, the symbols clashed and the whole congregation prostrated itself before the Lord. And that included the king. At the end of each verse, and at the end of the song, the choir turned around, faced the altar, and prostrated itself before the Lord. Prostration. Um, you know Psalm 95 that we use in Matins? How does it go? O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise, acclaim the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving and his courts with praise uh, uh, let us uh, bow down let us kneel and bow down let us what worship the lord our maker kneel bow down and prostrate ourselves before the lord our maker and it's funny you sing that and you uh, remain seated 
<laughs> or you remain standard. Uh, yes. Isn't that sort of a Gnostic notion then that worship doesn't involve the body? The body is something not to be used in worship of God. It's sort of this inner, inner kind of worship of God, but it, it, it just doesn't make sense to me. Uh, yes, you're naming it. It's, it's semi-Gnostic. It's not full-blown Gnosticism um, uh, because that goes in other directions. But it's a disparagement of the body and the importance of the body and the fact that we worship God not just with our minds but also with our bodies. Our bodies are very important. And what we do with our bodies is just as important as we do with our tongues and with our uh, uh, minds. Offer your bodies as a living, living sacrifice. Look, there's lots of places in Scripture that touch on that. And uh, that's what you're fighting here in North America. Because America, the natural religion of America is Gnosticism. Uh, it's disembodied spirituality, not incarnate spirituality. Um, so, if I can go back to the time of the Reformation, um, no, uh, there's nowhere in the New Testament that we are commanded to prostrate ourselves before the Lord, but you get uh, lots of references to that. Um, say, for example, Matthew's Gospel. The wise men came from the east, and what did they do before baby Jesus? They paid homage to him. They worshipped him. What did they do? They fell prostrate before him. And then at the end of Matthew's Gospel, there's other references too. Um, Jesus appears to the uh, apostles on the mountain, and at his appearance, the, uh, the most Bibles say that the, the apostles, the 11 apostles, worship him. Now, most uh, uh, Christians in Australia think, well, they, they held a service there and a praise service. Um, uh, maybe they didn't have a band, but they, you know, to do it properly, they would have had to have a band and they perform a praise service. No, what did they do? They fell prostrate before him. Uh, that's worship. Uh, yeah. We're stuck with it, unfortunately. So uh, notice the coordination between the burnt offering, the uh, uh, song of praise, the blowing of the trumpets, and prostration. They all interact with each other. And particularly the trumpets and prostration are the two sides. They belong together. The blowing of the trumpets announces the presence of the king. If you are in the presence of any king, uh, particularly the heavenly king, the only appropriate response is to fall flat in your face uh, and worship him. That's what uh, uh, <coughs> Dr. Scare was speaking about this morning in his own way. Yeah? We may be Gnostic, but there's a deep crave for people who want to be interactive and we're channeling yeah. the, the physical response from people. Who, yes. You know, so you get the holy rollers you know, back in the past mentality, the shirts and the jerks and all that stuff. Yes. And then, so, I mean, how do you respond to that? I mean, is this a response more for self? Well, you start off with yourself. That's always the place to do it. Um, uh, it's interesting, in the Pentecostal movement, you know, you don't fold hands, um, uh, you don't kneel, but there are certain mandated gestures and posture. What's mandated? Hands up. Hands up. <laughs> Is that wrong? No. It's great. Do it. Uh, but they wouldn't be seen dead going like this, or like this, or down on their knees. It's, uh, there's a lot of uh, anti-Catholic, uh, but also anti-liturgical bias. But they have their own liturgy, and they have their own. Uh, and what's more, um, uh, you don't sit, sing, uh, 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 sit, sing seated, but you've got to stand up because it's a bit funny trying to do this sitting down. <laughs> um, there are other uh, uh, gestures and postures too. Um, the thing is to introduce it as discreetly as possible as much as you can of this when you can. Um, it's important. Now, one, one of the most important traditional gestures that we have as Lutherans 
um, that connects with this is that we receive the sacrament at least always. I know it's not the practice always here in the USA, uh, but the old Lutherans would always receive the sacrament kneeling. Kneeling. This idea that you receive it standing is a modern innovation and uh, is rather Protestant. You receive the sacrament kneeling. Um, you prostrate, or well, you don't prostrate, but you uh, reverence God. And there's another old Lutheran custom, uh, which is you had uh, the architecture of the old, some, most of the old Lutheran churches was you have the church building, a classical box. You have the nave here, and then you have the sanctuary, um, the chancel. We tend to call it uh, sanctuary rather than chancel. Um, now, in most cases, okay, you have a uh, lectern, pulpit, altar. Uh, these days, the sacraments usually received lining up here. Modern churches. Now, the old Lutheran custom was to put the altar on a podium like that and people would enter the sanctuary to receive the sacrament. Now there's a deep, deep theological significance here going back to Hebrews that through the body and blood of Jesus we enter. We don't just approach the heavenly sanctuary but we actually enter the heavenly sanctuary the holy space. Now, how many of you have uh, ch uh, churches where people come? Oh, this is show and tell. It's not shame and tell. Uh, <laughs> just on the edge of the chancel. Hands up. But you see how common it's got. How many of you still have the old custom of actually going in the sanctuary? Make sure the congregation doesn't go all Protestant on you and say, oh, it's not inconvenient. The old people can't cope with the steps. You know, you know the kind of excuses that people make. And you can't fit as many people in. Um, that's a very rich old custom. Location again, gesture, posture. Yes? When you talk about going around the altar, is there a communion there? Yes, there usually is. That the old churches, or if it, even if it's not all the way around, um, uh, one of the very significant features of Lutheran architecture as compared to maybe Catholic and particularly Orthodox is that we have a central aisle and you might have railing here and here but there's a central aisle with no obstacles all the way to the altar. Now that rep rep represents the new and living way that we have into the heavenly sanctuary. So if we have railing, those of you who receive it in the sanctuary, do you have railing just uh, all the way around or just one, two sides or that part there? So you close it off. Okay, and that's particularly for older people. It's easier, more practical. Uh, who else had it? Do you have it all the way around? No? <clears throat> we do, but it's it, that's there, there's no there's no uh, line to the west of that. The, the the straight line that you're showing, we don't have that. We would have the railing right around the altar. Okay, you have the railing all the way around there. Yes. And that's the chancel. Yes, the chancel. Um, hey, it's not a question of right or wrong. It's a question of which is more appropriate which articulates our, and symbolizes our theology better. While we're at it, because we'll, we think we'll come to this tomorrow in another connection, the old Lutherans, and Catholics too, but old Lutherans particularly, uh, used to make a great deal of the fact that we receive the sacrament around the altar, but you didn't kneel all the way around the altar. It's a semicircle, as it were. Do you know what the significance of that semicircle is? The church triumphant. Try, you know, yes, the church triumphant. It's the other, the 
the, 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 the earthly church is there in front of the altar, the church triumphant is behind the altar, and then there's another nice thing, in some places, um, the old Lutheran seminary, uh, yeah, uh, uh, old Lutheran churches had cemeteries back here. <laughs> you, you have it, do you remember that? Well, I remember, I don't, we don't have it in our yes. congregation, but yeah, I yeah. certainly grew up in a church. The older and ones right behind the altar was the, uh, the paintings of the angels and so forth yes. on the walls. Yes. The heavenly kingdom was portrayed Yes, and then, 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 then outside at the back is the cemetery. Why is the cemetery located there? Because that's still part of the congregation. And they are the most significant part of the congregation. Uh, there is so much, we've dumbed down uh, the practice of the faith so much. Uh, and there's so much riches that's been lost, sadly. Uh, now, a lot of it's now impossible to recapture. Um, uh, but where you have it, it's worth defending at all costs.